our final keynote interview of the day is um, with Slim Williams from Cash Money Records, the co-founder of Cash Money Records. He started that label, as you all know, with his brother, Baby. And we also have Vernon Brown, who is his, um, what's the best way to, are you his lawyer, ad, ad, advisor, everything? attorney and business manager, so involved in many, many aspects of, of his life and career, and Michael Reinert, who you all met earlier, um, who has interacted with these guys in, uh, certainly, it, it, especially in his previous capacity as head of business affairs at Universal. Um, so they all know each other really well, and we're just going to let them just kind of freestyle and do what they want to do, but we're very grateful to have all of you here with us today, and it's, it's really great. So, Michael, please take it away. Thanks, Scott. Um, as Scott said, this is a, a lot of fun for me because uh, we all go back, geez, over 15 years easily, and, uh, you know, if you want to know what Vernon really does, how many people here have seen The Godfather? I want to say, raise your hand. You seen The Godfather? Okay. His real name is Tom Hagen. Okay. He's the consigliere. So, uh, you know, and he's a good wartime consigliere too, unlike Tom. So, uh, and as I said, I had the privilege um, back in 1999 of first meeting Slim and Baby when I was working at Universal um, doing business affairs. And, the, you know, the first thing I found out was there was this independent record label that had a distribution deal through Universal from New Orleans. Of course, my ears popped up re real quick because anything to do with New Orleans for me was just, okay, I'm in. Um, and I don't know if you remember this, Slim, but it was the Hot Boys release party, I think in 2000, and we all came down. These are the days when record companies were flush. We grabbed the private company jet, and that doesn't exist anymore. And we came down to New good Orleans. Old yeah, good old days. Don't do and that no more. And we, uh, we went to a Hot Boys party, uh, release party. I, I, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but it was definitely one of the more interesting evenings of my life. And uh, I remember, Slim, we were leaving the next day, and I turned to you and I said, man, I don't quite understand all of it, but we've, you listen to me, we work together, we're going to make a lot of money. And he turned to me and he went, for show. And that was... <laughs> 15 years ago, so, and I'm very, very proud now that since I left Universal uh, to be working with them on their side of the table. Um, so uh, this, as I, as I said to Vernon and to, to Slim, this is gonna be like sitting around the living room and talking the way we always do, so. Um, so Slim, you, you, you know, you're probably the owner of the most successful independent record company in the business right now. Mm -hmm. What's exciting you about the music industry right now? Um. It still excites me when I see artists that's new artists trying to um, get to the next level of being a superstar. Their work ethic, their um, passion for music. Um, that's, ex that's very exciting to me because it makes me want to go and work hard with them and, and, and make them the best and bring the best out of them. So, um, well, l let me put the artist side of it just to this side for a minute. And then let's talk about a little bit more of the business side of it. Because, you know, you almost have to look every single day to see what's the latest, newest, most important delivery system, okay? Um, um, what, what, what's exciting you in that world? Do you think it's gonna be about mobile, streaming? Where, I mean, where are we headed? We're heading to streaming. Um, streaming is gonna be real big. Um, the digital world has picked up, you know, and- Slim, um, excuse me one second. Sir, I'm sorry, would you mind? Thank you. The streaming world has, um, I mean, digital world has picked up, you know, on iTunes and all the other digital uh, formats. But streaming is the next thing coming. It's going to be super big. It's going to take the physical and give it a little problem. You know, earlier today there was a panel with two artists who, uh, well, when they started the panel, they were both independent artists. By the end of the panel, one of them was signed to a major label. But they both did, their, did artist apps. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about apps as an important way in staying in touch with their, their fan base. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as the right kind of tool for people to be thinking about? I mean, yeah, anything to interact with your fans. Because, you know, my thing when I'm doing with an artist, you know, I try to do things well. We um, build them. You know, if I could build them to have 300,000 people to follow them, then I know next time I could get 600,000. I could get 700,000. So that app is a great way 
of doing things because you're building your fan base. And I know as you build them and, you know, you get them um, their access to you and to feel to be a part of you, they can always follow you. They can always be a part of you. you know? That's kind of what we heard from the artists themselves as well. Um, so let's go back a little bit. And, and V, I'd like to bring you in on this side of it. Um, you guys had your own label. You come to Universal. But you've stayed fiercely independent. And so often you've seen people who just sort of say, well, I'll take the joint venture, I'll take the buyout. But you guys have maintained your own integrity and identity as a company. What's the philosophy behind that? Um, I think the philosophy was determining whether him and his brother wanted to stay in the business. And no disrespect to the major labels, but I felt that if we ever gave any ownership or any say from a major label into the operations for him and his brother, it would probably have been the demise of their future in the music industry. Why? Um, why? History. Um, name an independent label or any label that was a joint venture that is now still successful, still standing. I always say that uh, the Williams brothers are the last standing. Um, the list of labels, um, we could go down from so, so deaf, bad boy. I mean, it, you know, I don't have to tell you, the massive, it, there's a million labels, and the one thing they've all had in common, Def Jam, et cetera, et cetera, the one thing they've all had in common was at some point they allowed ownership or from the inception allowed ownership by one of the majors. What that does is it, it maybe brings in a large infusion of cash, but it also brings in a large infusion of bureaucracy, other people making decisions, tying the hands and, and decision makers of the people who are the creative forces behind the label. So if Slim and Baby are not able to say, I wanna sign this today, I wanna do a video tomorrow, I wanna do this, this, and do it that day in that second, it's automatically gonna tie their hands and that would have probably been the demise of cash money as we knew it. So if they had said to me, you know what, we wanna retire, we've been in the business, we're ready to go out and do something else, then I would have said, you know what, let's do that. But as long as they could tell me that they wanted to continue developing artists, building it, then I wanted to fight to make sure they kept their independence. Do you think today, in 2014, what you built is possible to start all over again from scratch? Do you think that the entrepreneurial spirit that you and Baby showed 16, 17 years ago, which still obviously exists in so many people, is still strong enough to be able to duplicate the kind of independent success that you've both had? It's on, it's on the person and it's on the people who, um, if they got it in them. Where I come from, New Orleans, we built the last through anything. You know what I'm saying? We done been through it all. There's nothing that can stop us. We, we done seen everything. So, you know, you gotta be that person you gotta have in your heart to be built to last. And, 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 and do it, you know, you gotta have it in your mind, your heart, and you gotta put it in God, and, and pray about it, and, and do it. I like to hear that. Let's talk a little bit now about the creative side for a minute, okay? Um, Scott, who I think had to step out for a minute, w w he and I were talking about this, and um, he really focused on how bounce music was a really important part of the music scene here in New Orleans when you were forming Cash Money Records and it became such an integral part of how the label was launched. Can you talk a little bit about that and then follow that up with where is it today, 15 years later? Bounce is really what we did anyway. I mean, we just took it and put it in another little form. Um, we have our little secret that we have that we, that you know that made us. We used bounce, up bounces up tempo records. People like to dance to it, and if you realize what we do, we do a lot of up tempo records, and our style of artists that rap, they have a swing to them. What I call a swing, they sing and they raps. So that's that's bounce music. That's bounce lyrics. So we we try to incorporate all that together to make great records from what we did with the Hot Boys, um, with Juvie, with Back That Thing Up. If you look at Back That Thing Up, it just was a different style of music, but we didn't use the Trigger Man. It's the same music, but we didn't use Trigger Man. Well, you created a unique sound. I mean, there is no question a cash money sound that grew out of 
you know, especially the early days. Um, how about today? What do you look for when you're looking at your roster? I mean, I, I know that your roster is very diverse. Um, we talked about this just a minute yeah. ago, but l let's talk about that now. I mean, you've become so much more than just a rap or hip hop label. What's your thinking in terms of the creative direction for the roster? I mean, we wanted to be a label. You know, they got labels that have all different genres of music. I mean, um, we wanted to be able to be able to put out different genres of music from rock, pop, rap, R&B, to whatever, gospel, soul, whatever we can, you know. Um, they have so many great artists out here that, um, that does different genres of music and you know, we want to give them the opportunity to <clears throat> put their talents out there and um, be successful like others. Scott came up with the questions that I, I never asked you in all the years I've known you, which I think is a great one. What music did you listen to growing up as a kid? <laughs> bounce music. You listened to bounce music. <laughs> <laughs> New Orleans, um, that's all we knew, man. Yeah. I mean, that's everything. <clears throat> I, I mean, we represent New Orleans to the fullest. Um, no matter where we go, no matter what country we're in, I mean, bounce music always a part of us. we always going to do it in, in one style or another. The people from New Orleans understand, and other people will too if they understand bounce music. Um, we keep the up tempo going, um, and we swing. Some of our artists swing their raps when they sing their raps. So, you know, we we listen to it. I'm listening to Fifth Wall Weaving on um, record right now. Um, let me find out. Yeah, I like that. I listen to it a lot. I listen to different stuff. I listen to all kind of music because, you know, that's what makes me what I am. If I don't do my homework, how can I even say something to an artist to tell them, like, you know what, man, you need to try this or try that. So I have to do, I have to be um, doing as much homework as they do. Okay, which leads me to, you just signed Limp Biscuit. Tell yeah. me how about that, that came about. Um, he met, I met him in L.A. and, um, he was telling me what he was trying to do. Um, you know, he, he had a situation that he, f he felt to believe that um, he didn't get the support that he needed. And I was, you know, we, we sit down and talk for a couple hours about how he need to not change, but expand the way he was doing things. And uh, he understood and he took a chance and, you know, and I was telling him, you know, try couple of different producers. Let's do something a little different that they won't expect from you. Cause, and he went, but he went with it, and he, the, results, the results speak for themselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be bouncing back and forth. No mm -hmm. pun intended. Bounce back and forth between some of the creative and business sides. And I, I want to talk for a second from the business perspective. Um, you know, you mentioned a moment ago, Vernon, about how if Slim and Baby want to do something, they have the freedom with which to do it. What restrictions, though, do you feel exist, not just for, from the, say, from a major label in a relationship, but restrictions that you have to be careful of as you're running this kind of independent empire, if you will, to protect both the integrity of the artists and the company? Where do you see threats coming from? Um, I think the biggest threat is um, being able to keep the operation as small as possible. Um, even in a growth factor of trying to become a large independent. Um, because what you have is you have a lot of redundancy. Um, you wind up having a lot of independents who will duplicate a lot of the services that they may get from a major distributor. Um, and sometimes even duplicate within their own organization. So I think you have to really look and streamline as to your marketing, your promotion, your artist development, your A&R, who's doing what, and effectively make sure you don't have too many so-called cooks in the kitchen. Because I think, once again, if we look historically at most labels that have not succeeded as well, a lot of it has to do with the fact that there was so many people involved in layers of decision making, and, and that's where you run into the problem. Too much fat. Exactly. Uh -huh. um, you could say, you. Um, and he right, because, you know, you, sometimes they have four marketing people and three, four A&Rs, that's just, so much, you know, you know, sometimes you don't need all that. You need a, a person that going to work with you and work with you well, you know what I'm saying, that you can relate to each other. And um, we have a nice little staff that work well with us. I mean, I know from personal experience that you never 
built that kind of internal staff because of the fact that you had access to a radio promotion department or a marketing department or a sales department yeah. and of course all the backroom functions. Mm -hmm. So you've kind of kept it lean and mean. Yeah, and, and it worked. And it worked. Um, so again, coming back to somebody starting a label today, somebody says, I, I want to try and be my own man, be my own person. Um, when you guys were doing it, you were selling CDs out of the back of a car. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, packed up. You, you can't really <laughs> do that. Doing trips out of trips. <laughs> so, uh, how, how, what would you say to somebody out here today who says, Look, I, I have a vision for myself with a, a label and, and uh, artists I want to work with, but where do I start? I mean, when I started, I made a mistake. Not really a mistake, I just, um, me had other people to tell me what they thought that I should do. And I wouldn't want no one else to make that mistake. Do what you feel. Build the way you need to build your operation. You know what I'm saying? You don't need a whole 100 people staff. You don't need a 100 person staff. You know what I'm saying? Keep it small. Keep it, um, have great people. Very smart, intelligent, uh, hard workers, people that's gonna not just gonna do eight to five. They do eight to eight, you know. I do eight for whatever, you know. I be up, and I and I work hard, and I still work even harder today because the challenges are so big for us today. Well, that's an interesting lead-in because I asked you at the top of the. Uh, panel here, what excites you about the music business? And this is for both of you. What scares you now most about the music business? <laughs> it changes. No names, no names, no names. No names. Uh, it changes a lot. Um, we hear a lot that the music industry is down. I don't believe in that. I mean, you know, it could be down if you want it to be. It's what you think of it, what you make of it. They always, I always hear, man, the music industry is down, so the records ain't selling the way they used to be. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's what you make of it. We don't believe in that. We always feel to believe, we always confident and feel that we have great music. I believe in these, my artist 100. And if it take that, I don't have to get no sleep. I have to go from pillar to post to put a post up. We're going to do what we got to do to make people Realize that great music is still here and ain't going nowhere. V? I think the, uh, the answer for me is the unknown. Um, I spend a lot, of, a lot of my hours per day now and, and assisted by a lot of other people, including students and everyone else, um, trying to figure out where, where it's going. If, you are, if everyone thinks back you know, just three or four years ago, if we'd have had this discussion and said, where's the music industry going? Maybe a few people might have said streaming, but I don't think that would have been something we would have heard just three or four years ago as where it's going. Um, so here we're talking about streaming, which is now I think representing close to 10% of the revenues of uh, most of the majors. Uh, is that where it's going? We all believe it and see it, but at the same time when you're looking at um, an independent operation, you have to think about it from a standpoint of where the income is gonna come from. And I think today I'm looking more at various buckets. Um, a major CEO of one of the, one of the biggest record groups, um, I was in his office, um, in fact, Slim was with me, um, I guess it was about five or six years ago, if maybe that long, I don't know, maybe four years ago. And he said something that was very interesting. He said, um, guys, we don't even have to worry about anything at this point. The only thing that we all have to do is just keep our head above water. We don't have to really generate significant profits. We don't have to generate, hopefully not generate significant losses. We just have to maintain because the key to the business is whoever maintains and stays in the game will come out winning. At the time I'm sitting there going, okay, that doesn't really sound you know, like the greatest, I'm um, looking for profits and, and, and okay, he's just he's saying just maintain, but I understood later that day and as time went on exactly what he meant. What he was basically saying is those who survive will be here when the new industry evolves into whatever it's going to be. I think we're seeing now this constant evolution and I think it's the key is staying in the game. So for Slim and Baby and other clients of mine, my advice is we gotta look at 
all the streams of potential income. Whereas before, if you go back 15 years ago um, or 16, 17 years ago when we first did the universal deal, you know, the income came from 99% one source, and that was your distributor selling product for you. Today, I think you have to look at your sources, maybe three sources, four sources, five, six, and maybe you're getting 10% here, 30% there, 40% here. But I think that's how this industry is going to have to evolve. Uh, I think that's where record companies went to the 360 theory was they had to participate in all the artists' income. But I think the record labels themselves have a bigger theory is we got to have pots everywhere collecting pennies, nickels, dimes, wherever we collect them because it's never going to come from one source. And going back to Michael's question earlier about independence, um, what's the advice for independence coming along? Can someone duplicate what Slim and Baby have done? My answer is I don't think there's really any other choice. Um, you know, I spend my days, uh, there's only a handful of, of major record labels and major record groups, and I spend most of my days talking to most of the CEOs of those companies. It, it's, there's really not many other options. Um, those companies' strategies are not really going out to try to find um, the next cash money, the next large independent. If it smacks them in the face, it's there. Uh, they're selling records. Of course, someone will run and try to get a contract and do a deal. But that's not their, that's not their strategy right now. I think the industry is more prime today for someone like Slim and Baby because imagine when they were out there, they were packing records in the back of a car, moving from one place to the other, running out, running back to the manufacturing to press more. That was their distribution model. If today you look at it, your distribution model is so much greater. You can reach hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people through social media, through other things. I think the problem is, is things like YouTube and, and other Twitter, it's getting flooded with so many things now. It's like the question is, how do you rise above everyone else and stand out? Which is something I think we have to talk about from a marketing standpoint. But I think today is the best time for an independent label to develop because uh, someone explained to me what other options are there. I really don't see it. Um, it doesn't take much money anymore. Back 15, 20 years ago, you know, to make a record uh, distributed, you had to at least have a five-figure account somewhere. Even if it was at a, even if it's on a shoestring, you needed five, ten thousand dollars, bare minimum. Today, I mean, literally, uh, we're talking hundreds, maybe a few thousand dollars, puts you in the game. Um, most of the records that we've seen develop and come out of YouTube with, um, that, that went on to become success, those records started out with basically no money. People shot a video with nothing. Um, they did a record in the studio with nothing. Um, so I think you can start it today with very limited capital and you can still stay independent because most of the majors are not going to come knocking on the door as fast as they did 10 or 15 years ago. And do the things they used to do back in them days. It's just a difference. It's a big difference. Um, you know, um, the marketing part. I mean, right now, artists market themselves and promote themselves through, through the internet, through um, social media. So, is that how you're finding new artists for the Cash Money roster? Are you are you trolling the social media world I mean, as we, well? Yeah, we do. We we look on social media. Um, we have somebody that does that. We um, still get people. Give me CDs and um, demos, and you know it, it varies. You know, I, I had a, a funny experience not too long ago. Um, I have a young artist on another label, and he's 20, 21 years old. And there was uh, everybody here know who Bob Lefsitz is. Uh, he writes a daily column, a blog. Um, you know, I, I won't comment on everything that he says, but he, he was writing an article about albums and how it's such a different uh, day and age because when we were kids, you knew that a record by your favorite artist was coming out on a certain day and you went to the record store to make sure they didn't sell out of the product. And I'm telling this story to this, this young artist and he goes, he looks at me and goes, sell out of the product? I said, yeah, it used to be. You could only had so many copies in the bin and you had to wait till the next shipment completely escaped his concept. I mean, this was above and beyond anything he could have ever, because to him, music is ubiquitous. It's everywhere, and, and it's 24-7. So, you know, your point, I think, Vernon, about an independent label may not have any other choice, which is very true, but I think there's also more tools available than perhaps there were 16 or 17 oh, years yeah. ago. Single, the singles, the streaming, all the digital stuff, it's just, it's so many different things. Um, 
you know, I used to be against the singles and and other things, but you know, I had to realize that it's just another revenue stream that um, helps, you know, bring in revenue. So, you know, what I'm saying I um, when I was first told that, you know, man, don't put out no album, just put out singles, and I was like, nah, you know. Um, and I today, have, I I mean, I do the singles, he's but still, we, he's still fighting that. Yeah, I'm still fighting that. <laughs> I ain't know. Yet. But you know, my thing is, we we we're a company that still today sell CDs. We still today have our um, sales is more physical than digital. We still today, people just like the packaging and and they want to play in their cars. Um, we 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 blessed for that. Um, we happy about that, but let me ask you: since there are so many different means and methods by which to market and break an artist, how important is radio now in breaking an artist? <clears throat> radio is important. Um, I, I feel that every um, tool you can make to market, use it. Um, that that makes sense, though. Uh, radio is very important. Um, you know, they they carry a big audience. Um, the internet is important. Um, yourself, as an artist, you, you're important. You have to um, make people believe in your music, make people understand you, make people get a feel of you. Um, fans, you know what I'm saying? You want to build your fans to know that I know one thing, such and such, come out with great music. I want to buy his music and be a part of it. So. Marketing is very important in all realms to me. Now, you've mentioned the fact that it's not just the record business anymore. I mean, 17 years ago, you made your business money by selling records. And I once got chastised for selling. I was sitting on a panel with Michael Guido, who we all know, and I said something about being in the music business. And he turned to me and he goes, you're not in the music business. You're in the record business. The rest of us are in the music business. <laughs> and it was a real truth in my face. I was like, wow, you know what? You're right. Now, the music business is so much more than just selling records. So how have you approached taking the Cash Money brand, which is such an important brand in music, and taking it into other income streams? I mean, um, <clears throat> we, we try and, um, to um, use it in everything. You know, we, for us clothing lines and um, endorsement deals and it just it's just so many different revenues that, that come with music now. You know, you could get someone to want you to be a face of a drink um that you be partnered up with. We partner up with a lot of different companies, um and to have a lot of different streamings of finance to come in for artists. You know, it really don't be the record company, it's more artists. Um you know, but, like but you're for, more now now you're more than just even a music company because you now Con oh yeah, well, we have a book I mean, you, company. You, you, you all may not know about this, How but, know about that? but there's a cash money book How line. How many people know about cash money content? You do, okay, great. Um, in less than two years, a book company that was founded, 100% owned once again by Slim and Baby, has put out 20 books, as of yesterday, 21 books. Uh, Wahida Clark's um, hard copy came out uh, yesterday. 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 Um, 21 books. We have sold over a million copies of those books. We've had, thank you. We've had, um, let me see, one, two, three New York Times bestseller, um, Ashley and Jaquavis, Wahida Clark, and of course, uh, Reverend Al Sharpton's book. Um, and that is a significantly growing business. Um, this year we'll put out, uh, I believe, somewhere between six and eight titles. Next year's plan is to put out between 10 to 20 titles, probably be about 15 or 16. Um, and what we see now is that business, which was initially um, established for one purpose, is now serving other purposes because the reason we named it Cash Money Content was because once you have books, once you have authors, you now have significant amount of content. Um, so I think we'll see movies, uh, we'll see some probably some television series and other things come from the cash money content, if I'm predicting, um, in the next 12 to 18 months on your neighborhood movie screens and, and, and HBO, Showtimes, whatever. So that is a major new business. 
it's very quietly done. It doesn't generate the profits, of course, that the record industry generates, but you know, selling a couple million books here and there isn't nothing to um, sneeze at as well. And tell me about the purpose of us doing it, what we talked about in London. Um, the book company was, um, was, was, was set up um, because I think it was about three o'clock in the morning in London, and we were sitting up, um, of course nobody could sleep, and we were eating, I think we were eating McDonald's at the time, um, and we were sitting around, and take us back um, on the trip over, we were on the jet, and um, Slim loves to read, I read all the time, um, and he had um, a book at the time, um, The Millionaire. The Secret of a Millionaire The Secret Mind. of a Millionaire Mind, and he said, Vernon, you gotta check this passage out, whatever, and it was about, um, uh, I forgot exactly now what it was about, but you know, we talked about it on the jet. So we were sitting up three o'clock in the morning, uh, quite a few people in the living room talking, whatever, and th the conversation evolved, and we were like, why don't people buy more books in our community? Why, why don't we sell books? And I said, you know, the book industry is probably the closest industry that I see aligned to the industry that Slim and Baby had already done. You know, you sign authors, they make a product, it goes to a distributor, marketing, promotion, publicity. The book is sold in retailers, digital as well as physical. I said, wait a minute, if you didn't know any better, it sounds exactly like the music industry. And we said, you know what, let's just set up a book company. And then we got people saying, well, I don't know if the book company is going to work because, you know, it's not a lot of sales in the urban community, which, first of all, we weren't starting an urban book company. And if you look at our list of the 21 books we just talked about, you would clearly see, in fact, coming soon, are probably two major cookbooks as well as a major political book besides the Reverend Al Sharpton's book, which is a big political book. So we said, hmm, how is this going to work? And then I remember sitting in a room with the chairman of one of the largest distributors, uh, one of the largest publishing houses, and they said, well, you know, we've had imprints before and various music artists and so forth and so on, and they really weren't that successful. And I remember um, Slim and Baby saying, um, the reason why people have not been buying books and they've not been reading in the community is because we just haven't told them yet to do so. And that was incredible, because I sat there and said, yeah, that's right, they haven't told them. He said, who better to tell them? We're able to go out and market, we're able to do things that we can do in the record industry, in the book industry, we can spread the word. So we can take an, 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 an artist, uh, uh, an author like Wahida Clark, who is extremely well known in, in the urban street market, and we can make her a New York Times bestseller. She just published her first two hardback books with us. She would have never been able to put out a hardback book before. No one ever let it happen. When they came to us and said, you wanted, we, she wants to do a hardback cover, hard, hardback book, we were like, okay, cool. I didn't know, I was, okay, fine. Um, the, the industry was like, well, you know, it might not sell. Uh, paperback has been the best format and whatever. We put out the hard copy and it was her best seller. The one this week is coming out. I'm sure it's gonna be as good as the last, if not as better, better than the last. So she would have never even had a chance to move her career ahead without being with an independent company like Cash Money Content. So that is a big, big business that I think is gonna generate a significant amount of revenue in the coming years from a different lot of pots. But it all began with just sitting back thinking what people that we are currently servicing, what do they need? What type of things that we like to see and provide to them that doesn't take us too far out of the lane that we're currently in, and that's how Cash Money Content was formed. And reading is knowledge, bro, you know, reading is knowledge. So I read, so I gain a lot of knowledge by reading. You know, and, and just like you did your record deal with a major company of Universal, your book imprint is through Simon & Schuster, is it not? Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, so before we hit questions from the audience, there's something I kind of want to circle back to, and that was, as I mentioned to the audience, uh, the first time we really met, the thing that bonded us was New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I, I came to New Orleans in 1975, went to Tulane, and um, I've been coming back every year since for Jazz Fest. By the way, I, we should have had a camera when these guys <laughs> pulled up, okay? <laughs> and, and the look on their face, because usually they're very, it's, uh, they're used to seeing me in attire, more like Vernon here, you know, and they both got out of the car and went, huh? 
And I looked at them and I went, first of all, we didn't even recognize him. We were like, wait a minute, is that that Mike? I said, Mike, where where was Mike at? He's like, there go Mike right there. It's Jazz Fest, baby. Here we go. (laughs) He loved Jazz Fest. Ever since I've been at university, he tell me about Jazz Fest. Every year, he's been here every year. I got to tell this story because it's really funny. Well, you and I and Baby were up in New York. We were in the office. He knew I was going to Jazz Fest. And he turns to me and he goes, why don't you take one of our cars? Because they used to have a garage full of cars that you would, Jay Leno would be envious, right? <laughs> I go home to my wife. I said, you know, Slim and Baby said we could take one of their cars. She goes, over my dead body. She goes, you'll have an accident. We'll have worries. We'll have that. You'll rent a car like we always do. Okay. So we rented a car. We go out to their offices. Where, where were those offices? In Metairie. Metairie, right. We go out there. And um, he says to me, what are you doing for, for a ride? I said, don't worry, I rented the car. He goes, no, 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 no. Let me send a car and driver for you tomorrow. Um, you go to the Jazz Fest in style. It'll be a lot easier on you. I said, Slim, that's very nice, thank you. We're staying at the Ritz. Car will be there at 11 o'clock. So I go down to Canal Street and I thought, you know, let me just check this out first. Big, beautiful Lincoln limousine, you know, typical beautiful stretch limo right there. Driver, all dressed beautifully in a, in a suit and tie, and he's standing there. I walk up to him, I go, hello, I'm Mr. Reinert. And he goes, yeah. <laughs> I, I said, well, aren't you the cash money driver for us? And he goes, <laughs> and he points behind him. Behind him is parked a sort of powder blue Lincoln excursion that might not even fit in this room, okay? I've never seen anything that long. <laughs> and all of the insignia had been taken off, and it just said hot boys all over, right? The driver jumps out in a FUBU shirt wearing one of the, big, the big cash money uh, <laughs> necklace. I said, oh, okay. So I was with about two or three other couples. We get in the car. We're, we're driving up Gentilly, and there was traffic. So, the, you know, cars sort of just going slow. And I look out the window, and there's all these kids. And they're chasing the car, and they're following the car. <laughs> And we pull up in front of the gate, the driver pops out, the door opens, and a half a dozen middle-aged white people walk out, right? (laughs) And these kids are going, where's Juvenile? Where's BG? What what are you doing with this car? (laughs) Today, I'm BG, okay? So... (laughs) You were anyway. in style. Though. And, and, and then you up, until, you know, up until Katrina, right. man. We had you right. You know what it's like pulling up in front of Tipitina's and my thing? So, um, but I want to talk about New Orleans. We had to okay? bring you in New Orleans I mean, style. Because we're here you in New Orleans, style. and this is, this is it. And mm-hmm. I want to hear your take wow. on what the current state of the music business or, or the music industry in this town is, where it should go, where it might go. I, I want you to just talk a little bit about New Orleans and, and the music, because this is where you came from, both mm-hmm. your birthplace and your home yeah. from business. Um, we have, they have great artists here. They have great talent here. There's no talent like, like New Orleans talent to me. Um, we, um, we pay attention a lot, because uh, we, um, we, we back and forth from Miami to here, but. We know everything going on because we have people here, and, and, and you know. Do you think? Do you think though that? I mean, I've always looked at it that it's been so tough for local musicians here to break out of New Orleans or the Louisiana area. I mean, I come down here every year for jazz fest because they're artists I never get to see anywhere else. They don't understand. I mean, you know, a lot of people just don't. They don't understand us. You know, like. When, as when I first went to Universal, for example, you know, I used to, um, BG was the first record we was going to put out, the first album we was going to put out. And, um, what happened, um, BG ended up getting incarcerated. And um, so we had to go with Juvenile. But I was, I never, they used to be like, Slim, you lying. I was like, man, BG's sick, he'd be back in a couple months. <laughs> and I, I, I just wouldn't never say nothing, you know what I'm saying? I didn't want to let people feel that um, because he was in that situation that we're going to give up on it. We didn't believe in that. But anyway, when I first went to Universal, I was in a room with 20 people. And, and I'm like, man, look, this is what I want to do. I want to put out 25 albums next year, and I want to do this, and I want to do that. And my marketing plan, I got that already together, and I want to do all this. So everybody in the room just looking at me. And I said, y'all don't understand me, huh? And everybody said, nah. 
Because every time I would speak with somebody and I have a conversation with Mike or whoever, they'll be like, huh? <laughs> and because they, they, our accent is so heavy, it was like, huh? I was like, man, you don't understand. <laughs> That's all Doug, I was Doug Morris had to learn to speak New Orleans in order to do these deals. And to this day, someone will be like, huh? You know, when they say, huh, I know they ain't understand what I was saying to them or trying to get over to them. But, you know, they didn't understand us in the beginning, but they learned to because after that, I had a meeting with Slade and Miss Jean Riggins and, um, and a couple of marketing people. And I was like, look, Miss Jean, look, I understand this um, situation, y'all don't understand us, y'all don't understand our music, but this is what I'm trying to do, and this is what I'm, running, uh, this is what I'm going to accomplish. And she was like, yes, young, young brother, it don't work like that. So I leaned back in the chair and just was quiet. You know, I don't do too much talking. I have to talk today because Mike can put me up here. But it's the most I, I've ever heard him talk. But I'm, 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 I'm sitting there listening to her. So I just, I just was quiet. So one of the marketing girls hit me on my knee and said, don't worry about it. But, um, you know, I had a somewhat of like a um, quiet attitude and wasn't saying nothing else. And she was like, you know, you got to educate the world. You have to educate people to the New Orleans sound. You got to educate people to how y'all speak. So I was like, all right. So we left, we, we got outside the door, and it was me and baby. And um, I said, say, man, we need to get back home to New Orleans. And we gonna, um, we gotta master this, dog. We got a lot of work to do. He's like, for sure, let's go. So we got, we got on the plane and came back home. And when I got back home, I called a lady, and I said, Miss Jean, you know, um, I wanna apologize to you the way I acted, because I was acting in a certain way that I shouldn't have been, because uh, I was just quiet, I wasn't responsive. Um, and I, I apologized to her, I said, Miss Jean, I want to apologize to you um, about the way I act, but I want you to understand, where I come from, we done seen it all, and we gonna be the best that ever came through Universal. I don't know what you've been, who you've been working with, but cash money and the hot bars and all us, we're going to be the best that come through there. And I'm going to be the best CEO that ever been in that business. And my brother going to be the best CEO that ever been in this business. And we're going to have the best artist ever. And she was like, you know what, young brother, I'm going to make you a millionaire. <laughs> and we, um, I learned so much from them at Universal. I learned about marketing. I learned about how to shoot videos. And I learned about business of it. I learned so much from Vernon. You know, um, man, Vernon talked 20, 30 times a day. Uh, he's a professor in law. So, you know, that's my right hand man. Even though he's, sitting <laughs> he's sitting on my left today. <laughs> but, you know, I learned so much from Mike. You know, I just learned so much from a bunch of people that I have, you know, I know I consider myself as being an intelligent person, and, and I, I have people that around me that's twice as smart as me, and it makes me better, you know, so. And, and I'm just going to add to that before we go to questions. Um, I, I, I've been doing this 32 years, and I said this to somebody earlier this morning. Um, now that I'm in private practice, I have more discretion and control over the artists and companies and people I get to work with. And really, one of the greatest privileges and one of the greatest sources of pride for me is to continue to be able to work with Baby and Slim because I was there at the early days and I saw how they grew under the tutelage of Doug Morris and Melo Winter and Gene Riggins and uh, many other people. Many and, other people. And, yeah, and, so many people. And they've you know, really taken to heart, as much as they had their own vision, as much as they had their own determination to build something and bring it to fruition, they were smart enough also to know that there were other people who they had access to who could help them and that they could learn from. And if there's one thing I could impart to any aspiring artist or business person here, um, 
confidence, dedication, absolutely the most essential ingredients to success, but also collaboration. And you have to know that there's always somebody smarter than you in the room. And if that's the case, listen to them. You may not agree, but listen to them. I but think that's important. Because you're going to gain something. Whether it might be something that you dislike, but it's some part of great knowledge of what they're saying to you. There's something you could take from it and make something good out of it. You know, and, and, and that's what I did when I met with her. You know, she was like, man, you can't put out 45 records. It ain't going to happen around Islam. Um, so what I did was when we got back home, like I said, me and my brother sit down and, and all my people are like, you know what I'm going to do? Since they don't understand us, I'm going to get a, um, a flyer. And I put all juvenile lyrics high on the flyer. And we put, we put about 500,000 flyers out. We made people understand us. You're going to understand us. We're going to make sure you understand us. So we, we, we passed out them flyers. And so it started catching on because it's everyday talk. Everybody said, huh, sometime in, of the other day. So what Juve was saying was, you know, when I, like when I talk with them, they'll say, huh? Because they didn't understand me, but it turned out, yeah, everybody here understand me, though. Let's open it up to some questions. Can we please use the mic, I think? Yes. Um, Mike, and thank you all, Mike, Vernon, and Slim. Um, I feel like I'm sitting back in my MBA program again and I'm listening to professors, because what you all have come to over the time in your experience, it's, it's rich. But you said collaboration, and there's something here that's going on that a lot of America has missed. You don't expect to hear Slim that respectful, humility, and all of that. And you know, when you read a lot of the research in business and marketing and trying to get yourself to come up, I'm not in the music business, by the way, um, the humility and the approach. And I'm saying to myself, is this real? I mean, this guy is super, super humble. He's more than six feet tall. And he's telling this woman, I apologize. I said, no, he's bullshitting us. I'm thinking to myself, this can't be real. But apparently, humility is a factor in that collaboration and being able to leave our market and go into other markets and have people want to help you. And I think that's a point that you're not saying, but it's obvious it's, you know, you're able to work with people rather than those who didn't make it because they're not able to work with other people. To my, go ahead. No, go ahead. To my question, and I don't want to upset anyone. When you look at Jay-Z, what he's doing, when you look at what Dre did, Beats by Dre, and how they're, and even Lord with the new deal she just signed with the cosmetics, it seems that you're so hyper-focused that, that there's so much more that cash money could do with the brand and the market and the product knowledge. Um, I'm surprised about the cash money content because that's actually the direction. Content is king because bandwidth keep expanding. Bandwidth is cable, bandwidth is internet, bandwidth is everything with the way things come at you. So content is king and there is not enough content. So why aren't you, how do you feel about the Jay-Z direction that he's going with uh, sports. And the reason I ask is because the move actually is strategic. He's doing it for audience. And because you have, you have distribution and access. Distribution is changing, new internet, whatever, but access is economics and how people are situated in the market. Can they really have access? That's why when Mike said, when you're saying that, you know, you can actually come up the same way we did, you're exactly right because access has not evolved to the ability of the distribution. So why aren't you looking P didn't, they didn't do it right, right well with uh, Master P when they tried it, Percy, I know him personally, but Jay-Z's figured it out, although, you know, so why aren't you going to those moves that's going to give you audience, a whole stadium, a whole team, a whole, you know, and it's because it seems like you guys are really, really astute with that, and that's my question, and that's, that's what I want to I just want to say one thing before you answer the question. Um, Vernon also happens to represent some of the most major athletes in the country. So he's very well poised to answer this. Um, let me answer, um, it's an excellent question and what you stated about humility and so forth. Um, when people ask me what it's like to work with Slim and Baby since I've been working with them for 18 years as their attorney, um, I say to myself and to them as to other people as well, that is one of the common factors that's been present with him and his brother from day one, respectfulness, Humility, learning, listening, following the advice when given, when they've assessed and gotten the right 
opinions. They know how to make the decision and follow the advice of others. And, and, and I think that in the entertainment world, we're so used to reading and hearing about egos and everybody, you know, I'm gonna do it my way, the only way, this is it. We hear that so much that I think we're driven to think that anyone who's behind anything with media and entertainment are some power hungry, you know, egotistical people who just don't listen to anybody. Um, when you work with Slim and Baby, you find that to be the ex exact opposite. They're always in the room, they're listening to Mike, they're listening to me, they're listening to other people, they're asking questions, we're floating around things, and we never try to make decisions fast or quick. Uh, we let it sit, we, we get more information. So I think that's one of the keys. But getting to your question, um, the first thing I will say is that every, everyone operates in a different way. Um, what operates and works for Jay won't work for everyone else. Now, I'll, I'll pose the question back is that you would have to imagine that cash money over all these years has been approached and has had every opportunity that you can imagine under the sun presented to us for growth in business. I can't tell you, there's probably nothing you can suggest to anyone in this room that has not been bought to Slim and Baby and myself from people all around the world, from sports to video games to you name it. However, we always sat back and said, one of the things you gotta realize is you gotta know where your strengths are and you gotta know where you can move and where you can't. So we've always been cautious to not take on more things and diversify so fast and so quick that you get that burnout, you wind up not having the right infrastructure, you wind up opening yourself up to other issues, other people, the press, the media, you wind up people taking shots at you, you wind up having so many things that we've seen historically bring other people down. So I think if you look at the core business, from music, they've moved Clearly clothing, um, you know, the Rich Gang, the YMCMB, the Truck Fit clearly has been all very successful. The cash money content, as we now know how quietly it's been, is probably gonna be one of the biggest growth things we've seen because, like I said, the number of movies and TV shows that are gonna come out of this and the deals I'm working on are gonna probably be incredibly important over the next five to 10 years um, in the industry that we're all gonna be affected by. Um, and I don't know how many people here are familiar with uh, GTV Vodka. Um, baby's vodka line, him and Slim's baby vodka line is clearly, it's not, um, you know, it's not, um, uh, give me some of the bigger name vodkas. It's not Chirac in them right now, but what it is, it's theirs. And they have not even distributed. So for those of you who are familiar with GTV Vodka, also realize that you cannot even go in your local stores right now and buy it. So you may say to yourself, wait a minute, what does that mean? Is it not successful? No, we haven't distributed it. Why? Him and his brother had a plan to just create a demand and awareness. They have done this so well that when distribution happens very shortly, GTV Vodka in its market, in its place, because it has a certain market, has a certain consumer that it's gonna be targeted for, will be one of the most successful vodka companies out. The key to it is it will be owned by Slim and Baby. So, that's and that's the difference the between us and them. You know, okay. and they, they, they just be, a lot of them just want to <laughs> say they're doing this and they don't have nothing. They're getting the 1%. I ain't going to just, I ain't going to do that like that. It, it, I'm going to do it right like I tell everybody. I'm going to do it right, I ain't going to do it at all. Question over here. That's everything. I'm uh, Say, a uh, local producer and producer with BTV, that's Balcony TV, and The Orchard. Uh, first and foremost, respect, uh, Mr. Local New Orleanian. Thank you so much thank for you. coming here thank and uh, sharing y'all uh, believe y'all perspectives and y'all gross with us. Basically, I'm up here. I think New Orleans and Louisiana. Uh, anybody else could come and try to make a case against me, but I don't think you'd be able to prove it that we have per capita uh, the best talent you're going to find on a planet. I basically feel like that, and I with. That. With, with that said, just from my experience being here, meeting all the artists, meeting all the talent, be it hip hop, pop, whatever, uh, I think there's significant barriers to entry into moving beyond the stage of the city. So for instance, so basically what I'm saying is, there's a big pot of talent, but they don't know how to get out of the pot. 
And what do you all think as experts in this industry, what are those barriers to entry and what are some of the things that you all at Universal uh, Cash Money have done, particularly in this city, or are doing to eliminate some of those barriers? Because again, there's nobody more talented than us. You say what you want. <laughs> at all. I believe we are the best talent. We have a different style from the whole world, you know. And, um, and that's special. That's, that's, that's something special. We got our own thing, you know. Um, for us, um, we have to, um, for some of the records I hear, it has to be done in a, a different format for us, lyrical-wise. The music, I mean, look, music, party music don't always do and sell. But lyrical, the lyrics of some artists has to change into a, a 16, a chorus. And, and that's what's hurting a lot of artists from here because they need to do their records as, you know, have a 16, a chorus, and, and format it different. Because some, you know, like radio stations, they have certain format they like, you know, but, and it, they used to tell us that a lot. But we, I didn't want to take away what we do. So what we did was we, we did the 16 and the chorus, but we kept our um, gumbo. Yeah. <laughs> we kept our gumbo. We, we would never let that, I would never let them change who they are. But, you know, that's all. They just need to change, um, change the format of the records so they could get the, get, get the opportunity and a chance to get to the next level with their own um, records. I can only speak from the rap side, you know, from here, because that's what I listen to a lot of. I, I just here. got a, a signal from Scott that we got to wrap up with just a couple more minutes. And, of course, everybody wants to get to Jazz Fest. So we have a young lady here with a question. One more question here, and then we're going to wrap it up for the night or day. My name is Amy Booker. My question is to you, do you think the industry is male dominant? If so, why and how can that change? Do you think it can equal, be equal for women? Thank you. Yes, you gotta have more women. Yes, I do. I mean, you know, the reason why it's like that because they don't have too many women coming up with, with, with records, you know. Uh, or trying to um, put out albums, you know. Um, it's just men putting out records quicker than women. That's, that's it. And, and I just want to address that for one second, not from the creative side, from the business side. One of the things that I always so loved about the business that I'm in is that there are so many women who do work in this business, whether it's at the major labels, at independent companies, independent contractors. Um, I, I realize that it's there's always a... a and not that there should be, but there's always a tougher battle for a woman in business and a woman creatively. Um, but the one thing that I really think that the music business stands apart from is at least 50% of the great executives that I've worked with and had the privilege to work with and learn from over the years have been women. And I think the opportunities are great for women in our industry if they so choose. Creatively, I, you know, I, I speak to, let the, 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 Slim speak to that. Yeah, I mean, it's just, they need to um, put more effort into putting coming up, putting more art, women out, you know, um, coming up because who, who, who was the young girl I met in Miami with you? Um, um, several North. Sarah. Yeah, Sarah. I mean, you know, we we had a couple, but we could use more. I mean, <laughs> uh, great music. I don't care if you're a woman, man, whatever you is. Great music. If you got good music, and you bring it to us or whoever, they're gonna get you out there. Because, you know, they just don't have enough. That's all. Okay. And we're going to wrap you know, it up. There ain't over no here. problem with um, we'll Wrap it up over here, please. Um, Gerald Page, as a professor of music and also a music producer, I'm fine. Um, how did you, being from the same neighborhood you're from, our passion? Sometimes our passion could be interpreted as we're coming across as super aggressive when we're passionate about something. Um, how did you manage to get people to see it's not that we're trying to be bossy? It's just something we really believe in and actually trying to get them to see our point of it. Because to me, I feel. Music is such a diverse language where I actually did my thesis on how music can affect the community. By me being from an urban community, I find that a lot of youth now 
you know, I love when I see Baby and Slim out and about because they're all giving back. It's just our music in New Orleans has been so characterized as all we want to do is promote derogatory situations instead of seeing the better things that's involved. So I'm finding when you're trying to go to these major companies as far as explaining your passion, how you want to use your passion as to something that you feel can change the environment, it comes across as being aggressive and that you're trying to bully them. How, how, how did you manage to tell that? I, um, I'm just confident. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it ain't even about that. It's about our confidence, man. Right. We believe this something we believe in. We believe in what we do. Right. I mean, we, um, I believe in every artist. I love my artists. Mm-hmm. They're the best. They work hard. I see them every night. People don't get the chance to see what I see right. every night. Uh, and, and for me to see how hard they put in that studio, Wayne, all the records Wayne sold, mm-hmm. Wayne worked like he never sold one record. And this man be in the studio, him and the rest of them, they might come to the studio at 8 at night, might leave 3, 4 the next evening. And if they could do that, and I can't be as their spokesperson, show the confidence in them and let people know, look, man, this is what we're doing. These are great records. You know, as their leader, I, who, who better else to show the confidence about it? It ain't about being cocky. It ain't nothing about that. I'm just confident, and I know, and I believe in what I believe in, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, I'm just blessed. God blessed us to be in this position, to be here today, and we believe that. But, and but we have faith that, in God. You know, by us being from New Orleans, we have a tendency, people assume that everybody that's in the industry from New Orleans, we just cocky. It's not that we're cocky. It's confident. We're very confident, exactly. Confident. exactly. The big cocky. difference between and, cocky and, 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 and confident. Come, and it comes across to some people as being cocky, but it's not. It's just confidence. Sure. Exactly. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let, let this gentleman ask a short question because then it's laissez bon temps roulé time. The lady got a question. Oh, I'm sorry. She was actually here before. She, I'm sorry. I did. I will, we'll get you both of you. I promise. We'll just keep them. Let's try and keep it short. Sure. My name is Kim Vudin, and I actually, for the past four years, have worked a lot with some nonprofits near the old Magnolia, and I'm familiar with your turkey giveaway and actually the co-sponsorship with the health fair. How do you see cash money's role in the community growing? Um, do you see that to be something that's always going to be a priority? Yes. Um, we've been doing that for like 16, 17 years, giving away turkeys. And for the past couple of years, we, um, I decided um, I wanted to do a health fair because of, um, I had a situation about um, six years ago, seven years ago, where I had a, um, a something called Marfan syndrome. And um, nobody, <laughs> they ain't know nothing about what was Marfan syndrome. And I ended up in, um, ended up in the hospital in Texas. And um, the guy from Texas, uh, the doctor, uh, I'm, I'm laying down, I'm like, man, I'm ready to go, I'm ready. I gotta get Wayne out of his birthday party, I gotta go to LA. Man said, you can't go nowhere, you got a bad heart. And I was like, a bad heart, man, I'm fine. But, um, and he ended up telling me I had Marfan syndrome, did I know anything about it? And I told him no. And I didn't know anything about it. Um, so he was like, when you get off the plane, I'm going to let you go home. When you get off the plane, I need you to go check into the hospital as soon as you get off the plane. But I didn't. I went home. I went home and got on the computer and found out what was Marfan syndrome. And um, it took me... Um, I called a doctor in San Francisco, who was the number one doctor, and um, and asked them, could they give me, could they see me? They said they couldn't see me, um, but send me your test. I sent them my test, and um, they're like, can you get that Tuesday? And this was a Sunday. I'm like, I'm gonna be there tomorrow, so I had to have a 12-hour um, surgery, and um, that was one of the reasons I did the health fair because then I come to find out a lot of people couldn't afford to have that surgery or to be tested. So my thing was to do, you know, I already was doing turkey and we did the health fair and we had, I mean, I got my doctor from Sanford to come down and all the health fair people to come down and look at diabetes, uh, dental, HIV and everything. And we got a chance to um, help a couple of people had a, a lady, her blood pressure was so high she was about to catch a heart attack. And some of my staff members put her in a car and rushed her to the hospital. 
And, um, you know, that's, that's important to us that we could help, especially people from New Orleans, that we could do something good for, because like I said, God bless us to bless others. And, you know. So and what's to the say, next project? And, and last to, question. To, to add on to okay. that, just so you know that um, the plans are for cash money over the next 12 to 18 months is going to be tremendously increased of what you heard him say and what they've done so far, you're going to see a tremendous increase in that. Uh, we specifically brought people involved, had meetings, to really start to see how we can, because what, what they can do is besides, of course, having a significant amount of their own money, they're able to bring in a lot of corporate partners, a lot of medical partners who want to be part and gain the visibility from being involved in something like this. So that's something I think you're gonna see a lot more of. How you doing, Slim? Uh, my name is Odell. My question is, um, with cash money being as visible as they are and as high profile as they are around the world, how have you personally managed to stay behind the scenes and with, with, with no, you know what I'm saying, no publicity, nobody really knows who you are, but you're one of the most powerful dudes in the industry, you know what I'm saying? And nobody, you Thank know, you. you don't have pictures out there, you know, a lot of people, but every time, you know, cash money is mentioned, it's always baby and slim, but nobody really knows. Um. For, for me to do that, I feel like I'm taken away from them. You know what I'm saying? Um, I'm, uh, I'm like electricity. You can't see electric, you know? But you know if you stick your hand in that socket, it's going to shock you. So that's how, that's how I look at it. I, I can't think of a better note to end on than that. So, gentlemen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.